Greetings from Camino Lutheran Church on this fourth Sunday in the season of Pentecost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are showing God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen.
O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all of the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Or who shut the sea with doors when it burst out of the womb? When I made the clouds its garment the thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Word of hope, word of life. Thank you. 
2nd Corinthians. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance. In afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known as dying, and see, we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak to you as children. Open wide your hearts also. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Let us pray. Gracious God, bless the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, that they are faithful to you and pleasing to your gospel. And Lord, whenever the winds and storms of life rise up, and we are frightened and we are uncertain in the midst of them and uncertain of the future, help us to remember always that you hold us in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, anybody who's lived any number of years within this world is going to end up running into those moments where the storms of life come up, those moments of uncertainty, those moments that bring fear, where, as in our gospel reading like the disciples, we don't know, and it feels like Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, and we wonder if God is even present. You know, one of the things I've always wondered about within this gospel reading that is familiar to many people, and you hear different stories of storms in life is why were these disciples, especially with a couple of them being fishermen, so afraid when this storm came up? But then I got a little bit bigger picture of that. And I, I asked why they were so afraid because usually fishermen in particular are very well prepared for storms that come up in the areas where they're fishing. They understand the waters. They understand uh, the weather. It's not that they're never afraid, but they're usually very prepared for that. And I would have thought the disciples were prepared here. And maybe they were. And yet, when I was over in Israel, I had the privilege of being able to go two times. The first time I went, I had to do a devotion out on the Sea of Galilee. And so as we came by in this very place, we find the disciples cruising. The story was being told that we have today. And the leader was telling us on that calm day in which we were riding, how quickly things can change. That when you look at the landscape and on each side over on the Golan Heights and over on this side, the winds will all of a sudden pick up and swoop down across the waters, pushing the waters. And then they come up and they hit the mountainsides over here, which sends the wind back and they come together and you have these amazing storms that can arise, that can, that can scare people and can turn over small boats. And so it made more sense finally when the second time I went, it was calm that first time, that happened halfway through our travels across the sea. The winds came up and I could see clearly, certainly they didn't have the boats that we have today, I could see clearly where there would be uncertainty and fear that comes up. And so as I look at our gospel reading for today, and the closer I looked at some of the details in there, the more I had a sense of where the disciples might have been and what might have brought on that fear. You know, in the beginning of the text, it talks about Jesus says, hey, let's go over to the other side and leaving the crowd behind, they took him in the boat just as he was. It's an interesting phrase, just as he was. So one of the things that made me wonder already is not only is it just as he was, but is it just as the disciples were? Was that not the plan for today, that day? Was it something that they hadn't looked ahead to? So that the boats maybe weren't prepared like they normally were. And the other thing is, it's the end of the day. It's the end of the day and how are many of us at the end of the day? At the end of a day of work, at the end of a day of doing a bunch of stuff, we're usually tired. Our minds aren't quite in the tip-top shape, that peak point where we're paying attention and noticing everything. Maybe this is the place in which they started to venture out. And so when they get out, well, Jesus, he takes time to take a nap. He's calm, he's rested. For the disciples, they have work to do. They're in the boat taking the journey bringing Jesus and the other disciples with the other boats that were with them across to the other side. And so the storm rises, and I wonder, were they not quite prepared for that storm? And so even for them, with seasoned fishermen on board as part of the trip, probably leading the way, were they ill-prepared for what came? Or even if they were prepared, was it even beyond what they felt like they could handle? And here, they've been on this journey with Jesus and he's done all these incredible things. He's got to realize the boat's rocking, things are not looking good, and yet he keeps on sleeping. And so what do they do? They go wake him up. And what's the, the words that they say to him? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They're like, really? You're sleeping? We need your help. Get up. That fear that comes. They have the sense that, that God doesn't care, that Jesus doesn't care in the boat. Have we ever had those times? the midst of the storms of our life, when it feels like God doesn't care, when maybe we're right in the middle of the lake and the wind is whipping and the waves are coming over and we don't understand why, and it hurts and it's painful because we've lost someone, because things aren't going the way we hoped they would go, and so we get in this place of fear and it feels like God is so distant away, 
or we are in a place where God is calling us to go across that lake to the other side and we're just fearful of even the journey because of what can happen along the way. Or perhaps we're all so uncertain about what's on the other side that we're fearful. Even along the way, we're fearful and wonder if God is sleeping somewhere or has God's attention on somebody else. So the disciples in their fear say to Jesus, don't you care that we are perishing? And here's what gets very interesting to me. Jesus wakes up. Now, I don't know about you, but in stressful situations, I've noticed a lot of people, and I've done it too, in the midst of the stressful situation and being woken up would probably look, especially if I knew I had the ability to calm things down and to make it better, would from the start look and go, geez, what is wrong with you folks? Don't you have any faith? How long have I been with you and you still don't get this stuff? Geez, can't you just know I'm asleep because everything's going to be okay? Don't you have any faith? Essentially is what we probably would say first. But Jesus flip-flops that. Jesus gets up, he looks out, he says, peace, be still. He calms the winds and he calms the seas. Then he looks over at the disciples and says, and says to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And I don't think this is, a, is stated in a way how I just described earlier. Why are you afraid? Do you still not trust me? Do you still not have faith in who I am and what God is doing here? but more of in the midst of the calm, now that their fears have been taken care of. Why are you afraid? And the afraid that's used in our text is, there's two of them in the Bible that are key. One is to be driven by fear, and the other is to stand in awe of God. Two, two very different things, and this is, they're driven by fear. Why are you driven by fear? So have you still no faith? He puts before them to ask the question, to get them to stop, to think, and to wrestle with it. And what's their response? Wow, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? There, their minds are beginning to churn in the way in which Jesus entered into their lives in the midst of the storm, in the way in which Jesus responded to them with calm, and when it was calm in the midst of the storm, not yelling at them, and now, with this question that is put before them to give them the opportunity to stop and reflect and think, where's your focus? Where are you looking? I have been preparing you for this. Open your eyes and see. Open your heart to the God who is present. And it is there that they begin and go, wow, who then is this? That even the wind and the seas obey him. And they stick with him. That's how we know that faith is beginning to continue to grow in Christ as they are with them. Because this is early on in the ministry. It's easy to say, how could they not? But they're still learning. They're still getting the whole picture of who Jesus is. And they continue with him and go on in that ministry. But that question, who then is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? If we take a look at the story and we go back to that time, for the people who would be reading this story, the people of Israel, the Jewish community, oh, how they would have had connections to it. Oh, how they might have seen it, maybe even a bit differently than we do. Because for them, the raging waters, the seas, the ocean, that wasn't their specialty. That was their neighbors, the Phoenicians. They were the big fishermen. They knew the waters, they knew the seas. But for the people of Israel, for the Jewish community in Jesus' day, the reflections of their journey showed them that the sea was a place of chaos. It was a place where evil things could come about, where destruction was there and present. In Daniel, in the book of Daniel, you have the sea monsters that are present there. You can go back to the beginning of the creation story and it's in the chaos, that chaos that God moves and creates. You can think about the, the Israelites, God leading them through the chaos of those waters into freedom, but that had to be moved. And then they'd be thinking about the story of Jonah. That Jonah, in the midst of the storm, had been trying to run away from God and the storm stirs and rages. And it isn't calmed until finally he lets those who are the captains of the boats he is on say that it's his fault. And it isn't until he's tossed into the seas that they calm down. They would have that in mind. And yet here, for, for, for us, in this, in this story, 
they having that in mind of Jonah fleeing from God, not doing what God had wanted God to do, and the storms raging against him. Here we have something different. Here we have Jesus not running away from God and God's purpose for his life, that he's on that journey to the cross, that he has a journey to make that will not be easy, but here we have Jesus who stands in the midst of it willingly, knowing that the chaos and all that's around, that God is present with him and carrying him on this journey that God can be trusted even in the midst of all of these realities of these storms that are going on in life. God's power is being unleashed and the kingdom of God is at hand. And in this Jesus who is with them, those first listeners would look and see that, wow, the kingdom of God is still moving and powerful and making a difference, even though it looks like things are being destroyed. That's an important piece. Oftentimes, it feels like things are being destroyed, and that certainly can't be God, can it? Especially if we're trying to move forward. But here, we have the power of God moving in things that are unexpected, not what they were thinking how God would show up in the world, and yet it is a power that is now alive in Jesus. So, and there's the storms. I just had a limb break down off the, from the wind off of the, the, the trees here. So I want to share a piece as we think about that first thoughts that the people originally hearing this for the first time would have had. The disciples' struggles in the midst of this happening and our own wrestlings with the storms of life. So I want to share something from N.T. Wright. It's from his commentary book, um, Mark for Everyone. He writes, When you read a good book, you often only see the point of earlier bits when you get to the later bits. Anyone who already knew Mark's whole story might well read this paragraph and see in it like someone looking the wrong way through a pair of binoculars, a tiny version of the whole thing. Here is Jesus with his disciples, going about the, their business. Here are the forces of evil, madmen shrieking in the synagogue, angry men plotting, powerful men capturing Jesus and putting him to death. Here is Jesus, not now asleep on a pillow, but slumped on the cross. We hear his voice. Why are you afraid? Don't you believe? And on the third day, the storm is still. The tomb is empty and great fear comes upon them all. Who then is this? Imagine this as a blockbuster movie. It would need a big screen to do it justice. An audition, an, an audition for a part. Make it your own story. Actually, if you sign on with Jesus for the kingdom of God, it will become your story whether you realize it, whether you like it or not. Wind and storms will come your way. The power of evil was broken on the cross in the and in the empty tomb. But like people who have lost their cause and are now angry, that power has a shrill malevolence about it. Christians, the church as a whole, local churches here and there, individual Christians, can get hurt or even killed as a result. Mark's first readers probably knew that better than most of us they would have identified easily with the frightened men in the boat. We would too. That's Mark's invitation to all of us. Okay, go on, wake Jesus up, pray to him in your fear and anger, and don't be surprised when he turns to you as the storm subsides in the background and ask when you're going to get some real faith. And I don't mean to end that in a, in a um, derogatory way, way or with his writing when are you going to get some real faith but church the church is changing the church that was the last 80 years is not the same as it's been in the last 80 year 80 years it's changing and it's becoming anew and in some ways we look at it and we see destruction but that church of the last 80 years was not the same church as the 80 years prior to that and yet we were still here and it is not the same church as the 80 years prior to that 80 years, that total of 160 years. And each time, as the church shifts to many, it looks like destruction. And in some cases, maybe that's exactly what it is. Because something needs to be torn down, to be removed, or to be remodeled, if you will, so that something new can come forth. 
That's who we are, a death and resurrection people. It's always in combination together. So yeah, if we're nervous about the future of the church as a whole, let us do what he said. Let's go to Jesus. Let's pray. Let's ask God, are you not afraid of what is going on here? You're just asleep, don't you care? And we know as we see these stories and we keep them in front of us, that no, God does care. And the kingdom of God is alive and well and powerful and working among us. It may not always be easy and no matter what, we can always know that God is with us in whatever storm we face as individuals, as families, and yes, even as the church in the midst of the world that seems in chaos. Let's pray. God, the storms rage around us. Sometimes it feels like you're asleep or away, and yet we are reminded in these stories, you're always with us. For that, we give you thanks. Give us the wisdom to see it and the wisdom to come to you in prayer when we're afraid.
Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you gather your people from east and west, north and south. We pray for the mission of the church throughout the world, that your steadfast love may be made known to all peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You laid the foundations of the earth, and the waters are the womb of creation. The morning stars sing your name, and all creation shouts for joy. We, we pray for your blessed creation, that it may continue to flourish and magnify your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You keep watch over all nations. We pray for countries experience violence, hunger, and unrest. Guide worldwide and local community organizations in their efforts to establish safety and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are close to the brokenhearted and near to those in distress. We pray for those who are experiencing oppression. Liberate us from the systems and chains that bind us. Remove the barriers that separate us from one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. You dwell with us in this faith community. We pray for our leaders and elders. Grant them knowledge, experience, and kindness, that through their leadership you may be exalted in this assembly. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We, pr we pray especially for those now that we lift up in our hearts or in our in or verbally. Lord, hear our prayer. Your love endures in all situations. On this Father's Day, we pray for those who are fathers or wish to be fathers, for those with broken or strained relationships, for those who are missing their fathers, and for fathers who have lost children. Bless and strengthen them, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift up our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forget those who trespass against us. And lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions all signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh,
Greeting everyone and welcome to the announcement time from the deck once again on this beautiful uh, morning here in the Northwest. A uh, couple of announcements to put before you. The first is our Benevolence of the Month, Mission Aviation Fellowship. Uh, we have been in partnership with Brian and Mary Ingebrad for a number of years now. They are over in Lesotho, South Africa. Brian is a pilot and, and Mary does a lot of work within the, the community. Uh, Brian spends time getting people out of this remote area into life-saving doctor appointments, getting equipment that's needed within the community, getting provisions that are needed within the community, so doing some wonderful work in this very remote area part of South Africa. And as well, our local person, Dave Perkins, our IT guy, he does work up in uh, northern Alaska, again out in a very remote uh, area, and he's an IT guy, so he brings communication and IT. IT skills and abilities to these folks to help them keep connected um, with the world around even being in this remote area for safety reasons and for for help with, with just daily life so if you'd like to give to that you can send a check-in and put MAF Mission Aviation Fellowship down in the down on the corner and we'll make sure that gets to that benevolence of the month or you can donate online or put it in the offering plate at church um, second announcement is I just want to say a big thank you as we just had our first uh, council meeting with the brand new council just this past week 
I'm thankful for them and their willingness to serve um, in this way and their, offer their gift of ministry in the church. But as I give thanks to them for this new group that's come together as we move forward, I want to give thanks for those that have gone off council in this last year, for their time of service, for offering their gifts. I know you often hear in churches that just fill in a seat on council sometimes, and yet I have always held that the Spirit is at work, that the Spirit is stirring, that the Spirit stirs people, and those folks who are on council at that time, in that place, um, in that journey, they're there because the Spirit has stirred them. And so I want to thank those who are going off for listening to the gift of the Spirit stirring and coming and offering your gifts. And I ask that you pray for the new council members um, and new council as a whole as we continue to move forward now coming out of this last year and all that's gone on and continuing to make some difficult decisions along the way with the interest of the whole community in particular the most vulnerable at heart always seeking to how do we best love God and love our neighbor as the great commandment calls us to. So please keep them in your prayers. Sometimes life on council is easy and it's a blessing and a, a gift and a celebration and a learning. Well, it's always a learning, um, but there's also difficult moments as well. So keep your council members in your, in your prayers. And then last but not least, um, continuing forward with worship. If you have been before or haven't at all, uh, just a couple changes that are, are being made coming up, just some simple ones for right now. We won't be doing temperature checks anymore. We don't need to, to do that. And then as you come in, the first week we had assigned seating. We're not doing that anymore. When you come in, after you have called or emailed in, still doing that at this point, just to let us know you're coming and how many you have. And we set those seats up um, in that order. You come in and then you go find the, the the number of seats that matches your section wherever that works for you um, in the in the space so if you're still not comfortable coming to church that's okay hopefully this online service continues to be a blessing for you and we look forward to that day when we will all be able to gather back together uh, within our, our, our buildings um, and see one another face to face and until that time we continue to be the church worshiping in a variety of ways and we thank God that we have the abilities to be able to do that in this time in this place in history so God's peace and blessings to you on your journey the rest of this week on your journey of faith may God continue even amidst the storms of life help you to see that God is present God's peace and blessings everyone hope you have a good week